Now, Rebecca and Lisa, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourselves? Uh, how did you meet? How did you come up with the idea for the Philosopher Queens? And tell us a bit about how the, how the project took shape, both from your initial inspiration to the finished product we see today. Yeah, so um, Lisa and I actually met at high school. So we've known each other for a very long time, about 11 years. Um, and this is my favourite part because I always get to tell the story of how Lisa and I met. So Lisa and I were in um, the high school production of The Wizard of Oz together, in which I was the scarecrow and Lisa was one of my three crows who um, had to, a very odd job of sort of following me around and taunting me for the entire production. So that's how Lisa and I met. Um, and we then went to Sixth Form College together and we both um, quite randomly really chose philosophy. I mean, I didn't really know what philosophy was until um, I went to the taster session for my, my sixth form college um, and met our first philosophy teacher, Matthew Kelly. Um, and studying that A-level syllabus together um, and with a larger group of friends was really where we became very close. And then we separately went off to do philosophy. So Lisa went to Durham um, and I went to King's. Um, and obviously stayed in touch and then we lived together for a little while in London afterwards when we'd sort of given up on philosophy and, and um, gone into real world jobs for a few years. Um, so that was really how we, we sort of became friends, started our love of philosophy together. Um, but it's really Lisa's story for how the book began. So maybe Lisa, you'd like to talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So I think Rebecca and I were in a quite a similar place when we moved to London and we loved our undergraduate degrees, but um, we kind of didn't necessarily feel like philosophy was a place for us in terms of a future career. So we, we both got jobs. Um, but one day I actually had some annual leave um, from work. So I just went into a bookshop and I was really interested in Mary Warnock, who was one of the women featured in the book, um, who led a really fascinating life doing philosophy, but also a lot of kind of public policy work. Um, and I found her such an interesting person, but it made me realise I just didn't know anything about any other women philosophers, and that just felt like a huge gap. So I just walked into Waterstones being like, oh, it'd be great to just get like an introductory book on women philosophers. Um, didn't find any. Um, there was one or two books on, on Hannah Arendt um, in terms of women philosophers, um, but other than that, really none. But then I did find a lot of these books, which were all titled kind of The Greatest Philosophers um, or The Greatest Thinkers of History. And I just did a bit of a flick through and there were just no women in any of them, or there may be one or two that would kind of get the, the prize spots. But I think what also I found quite strange is so many of these books were also written by men, um, which also seemed like um, a bit of a shame because we, we knew they were practicing philosophy so I kind of jokingly put on Twitter like I'm going to make a book called The Greatest Philosophers and it's going to be all women all written by women um, and then a few people were like oh my goodness you should definitely do it but I obviously thought it was just a, throw, a throwaway comment and it was actually Rebecca who was like why don't we actually try and make this book um, which was kind of a bit of a light bulb moment and it became quite clear to us quite quickly we obviously didn't have the knowledge to do that so instead we reached out to some amazing women some of whom are on the call today um, both joining us but also just watching which is which is really exciting and yeah it just grew from there really and we were supported by our publishers to do the crowdfunding and so many of our supporters again are on the call at the moment so um, yeah it's, it's been a crazy journey but super super happy that it's it's come to this point. Well, we'll be coming back to you um, for more of the story at the end, but now I want to turn to some of the questions from the audience. We have some pre-submitted questions. And don't forget, you can also post your questions right now in the Q&A, and I'll be checking it from time to time, and I will try and get in as many as possible. So, Lisa and Rebecca, here is a, our first off. How did you decide which women to include in this book? So Rebecca, would you like to start? Yeah, so it's, we get asked this question a lot. Um, and often when people heard about the book through the crowdfunding campaign, many people were sort of like, oh, this is fantastic, but I wish you'd included um, Philippa Furt or, or people that could have been in the book but but we had to leave out because of because it would be too big to to include everyone of course which is why we have the more philosophers more philosopher queen section in the back um so we really started by essentially just emailing women philosophers that we knew so i had i had a really great supervisor at 
um, Kings called Sarah Fine, who works on the philosophy mm. of immigration. Um, and she put me in touch with a few women working today that she thought would be interested. And to begin with, that's how we were um, approaching people. And we were asking them which women they would like to write on. Um, so that was how we got about the first six or seven. And then we realized quite quickly that all the women that we were being recommended um, to be writers and all the women that they were selecting were from the English, were mostly English, um, were all white um, and were usually very privileged. So we wanted to make sure that the book doesn't only represent women in philosophy, but also represents the sort of breadth of philosophy that happens across the world, not just in Europe, and philosophy that is done by people from other underrepresented group groups. Um, so then we started sort of looking for people, um, specifically who we knew would be able to write on these women. So we have a, like a fantastic chapter on Van Zhao by Eva Mann. Um, we have, uh, that's how we found our writer for the Yaya chapter. Um, so, so then we started being more selective and, and finding women philosophers that we knew we wanted to be in the book. Um, so that's why we couldn't include everyone, but we wanted to make sure we had this, this breadth. Yeah. yeah, Lisa, did you want to add anything to that or? No, I think that's great. And I think um, we're quite proud of the selection that we kind of ended with. I feel like the women who have contributed chapters um, are all not only brilliant writers, but I think also have really kind of diverse perspectives. And that was something that I think was really important to us. So um, yeah, it's really hard, but we never wanted this to be an encyclopedia. So our hope is that there are more books written about more women who even maybe aren't included, but hopefully ours at least gives a bit of a kind of a taste and a snapshot. Now, I think you've really already answered uh, the next question I have here, and I think the answer is within the book itself, because the question says, were there any philosophers you wanted to include that didn't make the cut? Uh, is there an honourable mentions list? Well, indeed, you can, you've already touched on a list at the end of the book. So Lisa, do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, so I think a lot of this came from how much we struggled to pick. Um, and there were so many amazing women who we kind of wanted to yeah, like highlight to people, I think particularly from some kind of areas and communities that we weren't able to represent. So, for example, we don't have a philosopher from kind of who specialised in like Latin American philosophy, for example. So it just enabled us to kind of broaden out that perspective a bit. I mean, obviously, even picking that list then becomes challenging because yeah, yeah. you still want to include more and more people. But um, I think part of this book is obviously not only about the content, but it's also just a celebration of women in philosophy, both past and present. And we thought it was quite a nice way to kind of, for people that say there aren't women philosophers, just to highlight, it's not like we had to scrape around to find 20. Um, there were clearly many kind of hundreds more that we could have chosen. Now, one final question uh, from, the, from the audience before we turn to our first guest, Anita Allen. And a really interesting, good question. What was the hardest thing about creating the book? It might be an intellectual problem. It might be a practical problem. So, um, Rebecca, would you like to start? What was the hardest thing about creating this book? I don't, I don't know whether there was anything that was that hard. I mean, I think that choosing the women was difficult. And that Lisa and I did have lots of very long conversations about how we should be making that selection and who we should be going to next and what kinds of people we haven't managed to represent in the book. But I actually think the chapters that we got from the women were so well written that we really didn't have to do very much work on, on those, um, those chapters that we got. And Lisa and I, Lisa and I um, obviously wrote our own chapters. That was probably the hardest part for me because I know that so many people um, Hannah Arendt is probably one of the more mm. popular women that people actually do know quite a lot about. Mm. And people who like Hannah Arendt re really do really like Hannah Arendt. Yes. So I, was, I was worried about um, representing her well and um, making sure that I didn't make any mistakes, um, but that I was also not, um, that I was also showing a sort of accurate interpretation of, yeah. of her work yeah. as well. Yeah, so, I mean, um, huge hugely timely right now and so you know I think on totalitarian on totalitarianism apparently sold out in the US uh, within days of uh, 
of the last uh, election, yes. Um, but also you did, you know, I noticed that you didn't sugarcoat the fact that she was a racist and in many ways, certainly not overtly a feminist. So, you know, that interesting complexity. Uh, so, well, fantastic. Well, we got many more questions from the um, audience and I can see Q&As are coming in right now. We'll answer, get to as many as possible, but time now to welcome uh, Fab first guest, uh, Professor Anita Allen, Henry R. Professor, sorry, Henry R. Silverman, Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania. For the Philosopher Queens, she wrote, uh, as we've seen, a highly timely chapter on Angela Davis, and she's also the subject of a chapter herself by Ilhan Dahir. So, Anita, welcome. Um, it's lovely to have you with us. Um, what is it like reading a chapter about your own life and work? Amazing, uh, truly amazing. I think that uh, uh, Ilhan Dahir did a great job. She and I have never met. And when you know that someone you've never met is going to write about you, there's always some apprehension. But she did a fantastic job. First of all, she really got the centrality of my life, of my being what we call in America, a military brat. My father was a career soldier and my whole uh, childhood was shaped by living on ammunition plants and across the street from firing ranges and in infantry, <laughs> airborne training fields and that kind of thing. And it really shaped me and made me uh, uh, very, very open to change and to diversity. And so she got that. She also got the centrality of my uh, passion for the philosophy and law of privacy. And the chapter spends a lot of time focusing on my interest in, in privacy. Yeah. And then finally, yes. uh, she appreciated the, the, some of the leadership roles that I've had. She mentions that I was uh, recently the uh, president of the American Philosophical Association, uh, one of the few women who've ever held that, uh, such a position, but I'm also the only black woman who's been uh, president of any division of the American Philosophical Association. So she got some of my uh, accomplishments, the, my passions, my, my history. I thought you did a fabulous job and it was such a, an amazing thing. I've, I'm giving the book to everyone I know for holidays <laughs> and my 24 year old daughter is incredibly proud of her mom. And um, you yourself wrote a chapter on the extraordinary life and work of Angela Davis. So how did you approach writing such a, a rich and complex uh, uh, life? What did you feel were the, the key areas to focus on? Well, um, one of the reasons I chose to write about her as opposed to any number of other women philosophers whom I admire is that she had a unique impact on me. She was the symbol, the figure of a woman philosopher that inspired me and that gave me the courage as a black girl, teenager, to pursue an undergraduate and graduate education in philosophy. So she was very important to me. And I've since discovered that Angela Davis was very important to other uh, young women philosophers as well. So how do you distill a life? And her life was so complex because not only was she a serious academic philosopher, but she also was a major political uh, figure in the United States, a radical, someone who uh, stood for black power. Uh, she was part of the Black Panther movement. She was an, a, a communist, uh, as we say, a card carrying communist, uh, member of the Communist Party. And she went to prison uh, as, uh, because a gun that she had purchased was used in an assassination of a judge and some, uh, some uh, potential witnesses in a courtroom in Marin County, California. So what a, what a life, you know, <laughs> that, that she yeah. led. So I, I, I began by telling the simple story of her background, which is, which is a you know, Southern girl from Alabama, middle-class parents who were left-wing. They sent her to a left-wing school in New York. She went to Brandeis University. She then studied under Herbert Marcuse, who's a German philosopher who spent a lot of time in the US. She went to Germany. She studied German there. She got her PhD eventually from, a, a, I think it was Humboldt University, but she, but she studied in Europe. And she, she, she represented a pattern that was very um, um, followable for me. So I, and I, and I took her, her leadership very seriously. Um, so, so, so putting the story of her serious academic background together with her popular um, uh, uh, figure as an icon, the big Afro hairdo, which is, you know, she, she really created a whole generation of young black women who wore this big Afro hairdo. She's the reason we wore the Afro hairdo, Angela Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, 
I took the hairstyle as well. So, so putting the, the silly stuff like the hair in the context of her politics, the politics of the 1960s and 70s, uh, the uh, African-American civil rights movement, uh, but also in the context of, of the development of German Marxist critical theory philosophy, Frankfurt School of Philosophy, was something, was a trick, as you say, it was not easy to put all that together. I did my best and I hope Rebecca and Lisa <laughs> were happy with what I came up with. Well, you did a great job. And of course, I'm, I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure she's just, we've just been watching her represented on our screens in um, Mrs. America, have we not? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, so she, she, she truly is an icon and a public figure in the U.S. Uh, she's in, been in the news a lot lately in connection with her controversial views about Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. I don't share her views about Israel, by the way, but mm -hmm. I do share many of her views about the, um, the, the problems with our prison systems in the U.S., over-incarceration of, of, um, of men and women, especially Black men and women. Uh, I share her concerns about reproductive health and autonomy. Uh, so we have a lot in common, but there are some differences in our opinions. Of course. I mean, and one of the wonderful things about this book is precisely that it gets rid of any kind of, you know, one size fits all stereotypes. We see the rich, intricate complexity and the lived experiences and the historical and geographical shapings of, of all the women in this, in this book, as, as indeed we should. Well, that's lovely. So do, I hope you do stay with us. It's, it's a, a joy to have you with us and a personal pleasure of, uh, to, for me, given I'm currently um, sort of um, writing sort of um, bibliographies on you for one of my lecture courses next term. So thank I can you. Be help, just reach out. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Please stay with us. Now I want to turn to one or two of the questions which you're submitting right now online, which is fantastic. So greetings to, and apologies if I pronounce anybody's name wrong, uh, greetings to Aurora Georgina Bustos Arelli from Mexico. So welcome. I, what time is it in Mexico? Um, the question here, do you have any further plans to translate this important book to other languages like Spanish and introduce this work in other non-philosophical mainstream audiences? So a very good question. Uh, Lisa, do you want to start? Yeah, so um, we have some good news about that, actually. So we have um, some translation deals for a few languages, um, although sadly, I don't think we have Spanish yet. Um, the current languages we have translations for um, are German, Dutch, Turkish, Romanian and Japanese. So quite um, a, a range. Um, but fingers crossed, um, we will get a translation deal for Spanish because that would be wonderful. Um, and as soon as we know, we will definitely promote it. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed. We would love for it to be in Spanish. Okay, now we have here from Carlin Romano, um, a really, wow, this is a rich and tricky question. So I'll start with, Rebecca, you can kick off with this. Uh, a very good question. Is there any different, now this particularly mentions the UK and the US, we, we might want to broaden it out, but let's start with the UK and the US. Is there any difference between the UK and the US in regard to the respect with which women philosophers are treated by male philosophers and other men? And the person goes on, this is Carlin Romano, given that the UK has had a woman prime minister, and a royal queen for decades. I wonder if that makes any cultural difference. Rebecca, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah, I can't. Well, I can't really speak for how women philosophers are treated in the US, but I've I've heard sort of horror stories from women in philosophy everywhere. So, I I don't think I don't think it makes that much cultural difference that we've had um, two women prime ministers and the queen. So. I, no, I don't think it makes that much cultural difference. It doesn't make that much cultural difference to how women are treated in philosophy, um, because that's a very. It feels like a very distinctive area. Obviously, there are differences. There are ways in which sort of patriarchy and misogyny can blend into to our subject, but I, I don't think it does impact it. Um, but maybe somebody from the US has a different opinion or thinks that it's somebody who's been to both places thinks it's particularly bad in one of them. But If any of our audience have views on this, please yeah. uh, contribute to the chat function and that would be, that would be excellent. Um, Angie, may I answer a point? Angie, may I answer a point? 
Of course, yeah, I, please. So, so Colin Romano, the gentleman who asked the question, he deserved to be recognized. He is the author of a very important book called America the Philosophical, which is a very, very massive, uh, I think it's almost 600 page history of philosophy in the US. And he, uh, unique okay. to other historians of philosophy, he includes uh, chapters on women, feminist philosophers, people of color. It's an amazing uh, retelling of the history of philosophy that is truly inclusive. So I just want to give Carlin a shout out and I'm so glad he's joined the call. Thanks, I won't put it again. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's Thank great. You. Fantastic. Now we have, well, there's two questions here. I'll take one to start. Oh, there's lots of questions from now. Again, apologies to you, Daniel. Um, I'm reading Daniel McRae. I may be quite wrong in how I've pronounced that. Um, I'll start with one of your questions, Daniel. Um, and Lisa, you might want to kick off with this. Is there a key theme which links the work or approach of all the thinkers? Well, that is a good question. Um, I think in terms of content, whilst there are some areas where they tend to maybe skew based on the choices that we've made, we potentially have a bit more of a focus on kind of ethics and political philosophy. However, I think the thinkers do cover a really broad range of topics. So we also have writers that talk about uh, metaphysics and epistemology. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's one core theme, but then we do get the question of kind of what counts as an inclusion to kind of make it into the book. So there has to be a thread that I think does run consistently throughout all of them. And I think what we usually say in response to that is they're all women that have thought incredibly intelligently and rigorously and logically about the world um, and shared those thoughts with the world. Um, so I think what really kind of holds them together is the kind of intellectual powerhouses um, that they were in the way they thought about the world. Um, Rebecca, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. I, I agree with Lisa. I think um, women philosophers have worked in all areas of, of philosophy and we try quite hard in the book to, to make sure that we had that breadth. Um, and yeah, so we, we do adopt a slightly more inclusive uh, understanding of philosophy than, than some. Now we have a question, well it's a comment but I want to read it out because it's such an interesting comment and again apologies I speak no Turkish. This is from Dilara Sengul and that's probably way off from Turkey but you're very welcome and lovely to have you with us and she, oh I don't even know, they write, they write, when I heard about the book for the first time I've shared my excitement with many people and some of them said things like, okay, there is no such thing as a woman philosopher and other comments like that. Um, I wonder if they, and I imagine that they mean Rebecca and Lisa, I wonder if they had these kind of comments themselves. Thanks from Turkey, by the way. So that's quite interesting. So when you said, oh, we're doing this book on women philosophers, did people kind of say, did anybody say to you, oh, that's gonna be short or, you know, what, what responses did you get? Um, most people were very supportive so I think we're lucky that we seem to have hit a nerve with the book I think lots of people lots of people have reacted as if they needed a book like this for a long time um, so yeah most people were very supportive we did have we didn't usually have people say oh there's no such thing as a woman philosopher what we did have was people saying things like oh, I don't evaluate people's philosophy by their gender. I just read good philosophy, which of course <laughs> is laden with the idea that women don't write any good philosophy, um, in which case they should really read our book. Um, so we have had, yeah, we've, we've had a few mm. comments like that, but overwhelmingly people have been really, really supportive. Okay, thank you. Now, oh, now there was a, oh, they've gone, hang on. There was a wonderful question and it's vanished. Ah, okay. Um, right, so I want to go, and this is a pre-submitted question, and yes, which woman philosopher, this is for Lisa and Rebecca, which woman philosopher has inspired you most in your own studies? Lisa, do you want to start that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think for me, um, whilst I love Hypatia, who I wrote my chapter about, um, she was much more public <laughs> in her philosophy than potentially I am, uh, maybe more of an aspirational figure. So I think for me, it's, it's probably Mary Warnock, who I mentioned earlier, who lived an absolutely fascinating life. And 
she led the commission in the UK um, when IVF first became a new technology and she created the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority um, and really kind of set the course um, for a lot of the kind of what we consider like modern biomedical ethics issues and I think she really demonstrates to me someone who was an incredibly talented philosopher but very engaged in kind of the public sphere and, and the public life and I think um, she's the person that I really look up to in, in marrying those two interests really well. Okay, thank you. Rebecca, do you want to? Yeah, I find this question really difficult because so, um, so I work um, at the sort of intersection between political philosophy and, and refugee studies and, and the most influential philosopher there is definitely Hannah Arendt mm. um, and I do engage with her a lot in my work but I, this idea of her being, so I, we often get asked who's our favourite philosopher in the book and even though I read her the most and I engage with her the most, she's not necessarily my favourite because I, I don't know whether I would have got on with Hannah Arendt particularly well. Um, I, at the moment, I'm reading a lot of Judith um, Schklar, who mm -hmm. um, was the, she was the first um, profess woman to be a professor at uh, Harvard School of Government. Um, and she was a refugee from Latvia and uh, she worked a lot on um uh, the notions of sort of evil, cruelty and injustice. Um, and in my work on, on refugees, I'm finding that very, very useful. So she's probably the person who's inspiring me most at the moment. OK, thank you. Now, do we have Emmy Smith, the illustrator, with us or not at the moment? Emmy, are you there? I think she's having no. activity issues. OK, well, then can we, is Ellie Robson there? Ellie, are you there? Ellie? Yeah, no. I'm here. Yeah, sorry. Oh, wait, Ellie, oh, <laughs> lovely. Ellie, then can we, can we turn to you? How lovely. Um, can we turn to you now? Because it's a very great pleasure to welcome um, Ellie, who wrote about the fab Mary Midgley. Ellie is a PhD student um, at uh, Birkbeck at the University of London. And I think you also worked on the great in parenthesis project at Durham University, is that right? Yeah, and that's those, right, yeah. For those of you who don't know, the in parenthesis project um, looks at the sort of, the fab four, if you like, of, uh, uh, of uh, Midgley and Foote and Murdoch and Anscombe, who all uh, met at Oxford and, and did a lot of teaching there in, in the war years, um, getting an opportunity that they rightly deserved, but they probably only got the opportunity because the male philosophers were off at the war. Um, they should have had the jobs anyway, but they have admitted that they probably only got their foot in the door because of the war. So a, a fantastic project. So Ellie, I mean, how did you approach writing about the, the wonderful Mary Midgley? So, what did you think were the, the key things you wanted to uh, tackle? Um, yeah, it was a um, fantastic part of this project. I started writing the chapter actually during my master's, so I was uh, during my PhD applications. So I've just decided to do the PhD actually. And um, Midgley was a big reason why I decided to do the PhD in the first place. Because um, I actually met her when I was in Durham through the in parentheses project, um, a few months before she died actually. And the, the day I got back from my master's, um, she died the day I got back and I met with my tutor Claire who is one of the heads of the in parentheses project um, and Claire told me that Mary had died and she was just like this woman is incredible and nobody's doing any work on her because she continued to be neglected post um, sort of Oxford days um, throughout her lifetime for various reasons I think a lot of the reason is to do with the fact that she was a woman and she she had a very unusual career um, but when sort of tackling this um, this chapter um, I start off by sort of describing her neglect and giving some, some kind of reasons why um, I think this came about. Um, but her philosophy is so broad, um, she covers so many topics like um, animal ethics, uh, environmental ethics, uh, she dabbles in feminism, she, um, she has a lot of writing to do with like meta philosophy, so sort of like how, you know, how we do philosophy and what the role of the philosopher is. Um, so covering all those topics was quite a challenge with this, um, with this chapter. But hopefully, I did her work a bit, a little bit of justice. <laughs> oh, you, you, you so did. You got that that wonderful vibrancy. I mean, duties concerning islands has been. You know, I've I've got so many kind of first year 
uh, philosophy students and students on other courses into ethical philosophy by reading Duties Concerning Islands, and it just really grabs them. She's a great writer and a great teacher as well. She yeah. really knows how to get to the heart of the issue. I mean, I had I met her several times, and I was it was one wonderful occasion. We were both speaking at the How the Light Gets In Philosophy mm. Festival in Hay on Wye, and she was always indefatigable. She was well into her mid nineties at this stage, and she, you know, she had a sort of a younger a sort of minder, but the minders were always exhausted, and Mary would keep going. And she, at the end of the day's talks, there would be music in the evening, and Mary liked to be in the main venue to hear the musical events, and she would sit there in her wonderful hats and gorgeous clothes and, and jewellery and, and she would have you know adoring fans around her and she would you know discourse philosophy while all these sets were going on and on one evening it was quite late and one of the organizers went up to her and said and, and this is why by the way everybody i'm drinking water and you'll find out why i'm only drinking water in a moment and the organizer said mary you might want to leave the venue for the next um, set because it's a punk feminist band called The Cunning Stunts. Uh, so you see why I'm on water and their lyrics are very fruity and you might might want to leave. She said, no, no, she said, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. So the Cunning Stunts did their, their set. They did their thing um, excellently. And Mary was just kept going, discoursing philosophy, absolutely unfazed by any of the of the antics on stage. It was a wonderful moment. And she, yeah, she was eventually sort of forced to go to bed at one in the morning. It was wonderful. That's how you get to be active still at 97, 98, I think. So, uh, wonderful. So now, um, what have we... Ah, right, yes. So we've got more comments here saying we need this in Greek. So I'm hoping you're getting a Greek translation as well as Spanish. Um, now, here we have a question, really, my goodness me. Um, This is great fun. If you could have dinner with any three, uh, not even five others, we're currently allowed in the UK, parties of six. So if, if Lisa and Rebecca, if you're on your own hosting a dinner party, you're not allowed to invite five others. You're allowed to invite only three in this question of the philosopher's features. Which three would you choose and why? Lisa, do you want to have a go? This is a really tricky question. Um, Oh my goodness. Oh, I think a dinner party with all of them would be a fascinating, fascinating I know, evening. I, know. Um, yeah. I think, oh, who would I choose? I think, I think Hypatia, um, just because researching her has been so fascinating and I'm really, really interested. Yeah. But her life, she lived a fascinating, fascinating life. And also none of her work was ever preserved. So I'd be interested to know whether she wrote her own philosophy and it didn't survive or whether that was actually just something that she didn't, didn't do. Um, and then, goodness, I think, I think potentially Mary Astle, who is not someone I knew anything about before reading the book, um, but actually she also was really interesting. She wrote a lot about kind of feminism and women's rights to education before Mary Wollstonecraft. So I think I have quite a lot of questions. And for my last pick, which I promise is not just because she's here, <laughs> I would have to go with Anita because we had a great conversation last week. Um, we talked a lot about philosophy and representation, but I'm also fascinated by her work in kind of privacy um, and uh, security. And I work in data ethics at the moment. So I feel like we would have some good, good chats about that. Rebecca, fantastic. Rebecca, who's on your dinner party list? You've only um, got three. Only three. I think the first one would be Diotima, just I'd be interested to see whether she showed up um, because obviously people discuss whether or not she was real. So I think I'd have to have her on the list just so that I could sort of settle the, the myth. Um, and then I would definitely have to have Iris Marion Young. Um, she is a political philosopher. She's somebody who I read a lot and, and her work um, is really engaging and very important and uh, she died far too young and I'm sure had lots of things left to, to teach us. Um, so I have a few questions for her, especially her, her book that she never finished. Um, so I have lots of questions for her. 
and then I think my last one would have to be Angela Davis. Um, we, Lisa and I were lucky enough to go to a talk by her at the South Bank Centre a few years ago. Um, and it was just, yeah, really incredible. So those are my three. Okay, now um, here's another pre-submitted question. I'm going to throw you both in the lion's den where angels fear to tread. <laughs> um, to what degree does philosophy produced by women differ from philosophy produced by men? My goodness me, your trillion dollar question, Lisa. Do you think there is any? Rebecca, do you want to go first on that? <laughs> um, um, I think my initial gut response would be, in terms of the quality, obviously not. I think there might be a skew in terms of the type of topics people may be interested in. I kind of do feel like there are kind of stereotypes that still potentially harm which areas women might think they want to go into. For example, Rebecca and I both did kind of logic and philosophy of mind at uni, but that was partly because we thought we needed to to kind of gain credibility to kind of prove that we could do like the hard stuff but i think even the fact that that's considered the hard stuff is in itself quite gendered um so i think there is probably a bit of a skew but i don't think that's to do with like competence i think that's just potentially where people's interests lie okay anybody you want to add anything no i think that's <laughs> Howard. Okay, so welcome to Marie Anne Castle Le Gros from Montreal, Canada. Hello, lovely to have you with us. Um, Marie Anne hopes there will be a French translation, don't we all? Oh, if you would write a second volume, which other women philosophers would you include? Rebecca, I'm going to give that to you. Yeah, so there, I mean, there is so many at the back of the book, we'd have to go through and pick our top 20 again. Um, one that I really wanted to get in that we didn't manage was, um, she's called Nana Asmu and she's a pre-colonial Nigerian uh, feminist philosopher. And I, I'm i just fascinated by her and her work. There's a really great essay about her in um, Aeon magazine a few, a few months ago. Um, so that's worth looking up. But yeah, I mean, it would be a very long and painful process of me and Lisa having to choose another 20 and upsetting lots of people for not including their favourites. So. Oh, um, this is from Fui Amavor, and again, apologies for my pronunciation. For Rebecca and Lisa, is it possible to get an audio or braille version of the Philosopher Queens? Good question. That's another great question. So um, we would absolutely love that. Um, for me personally, I audiobooks is how I consume so much of my media. Um, but unfortunately, they're kind of sold as rights in the same way as languages. So unfortunately, we'd have to wait for someone to essentially approach us and, and pitch it. But if we get approached, we 100% would say yes. Otherwise, we could try and do it ourselves, but I'm not sure if that would turn out very good. If quality. anybody out there is listening, here is an open door. We need this in audio. We need this in audio and braille. So hopefully there's somebody listening and get in touch with Rebecca and Lisa. Um, Florence Angelo. Um, ah, oh, well, this is intriguing. How have the authors of these greatest philosophy books mentioned that only include male philosophers reacted to the philosopher queens and being quote called out for not including women in their work have you had any feedback yet or is it too early for that yeah we haven't had anybody notice yet <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do badmouth a few philosophy books in the introduction um yeah so I'm, I'm looking forward to them discovering that we've got they are included in the list of books who don't include a single woman or only include one uh, but nobody's nobody's tweeted at us yet. Uh, this is from Simon, well, R E I G H, Ray, 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 I'll say Ray, apologies. I know this is about female philosophers, but which male philosopher do you admire the most for their approach to women? So, quite a specific question about which male philosopher do you admire for their approach to women? Lisa. Oh, that is a, it's a tricky one, not just because I'm sure, I'm sure there are many out there that do good things, but um, I'm just trying to think that through in my head in terms of linking all those bits together. Um, I think what I would say is we were really pleasantly surprised how many men pledged for the book. When we mm. first put it out, we really thought that it would be predominantly women who would want to support a book like this. <laughs> Maybe whether that's some like guilt <laughs> around the fact that this hasn't happened. But um, I think kind of, yeah, the kind of men within the, the profession other than a few of those kind of 
snarky comments actually um, have been very receptive. Um, so yeah. uh, no, none that specifically spring to mind. Um, in the yeah, I, people like Peter Adamson and his podcast, The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. I mean, he's incredibly strong on including women philosophers. So, yes. Um, right. Now, do we have Emmy Smith, the illustrator? Has she managed? Have we ever got a connection? Yes? No? Because if we she's don't on the phone. You think she's on the, on the phone. She's on the phone. Okay. Oh, Emmy, can you hear us on the phone? Because I certainly want to... Whether... Perhaps Hello. Oh, hi. Ooh, Emmy, we can hear you. Hello. Oh, well, lovely, Emmy. So lovely, lovely. <laughs> so uh, I want to welcome Emmy Smith, who is an, a freelance, um, also known as Emmy Lupin, I think, who's a freelance... Yeah. Uh, to working in London and she's produced these very beautiful and distinctive portraits of each of the queens and I think you also designed the cover um, uh, along with the book's publisher on Bound. So Emmy it's lovely that you can join us and thank you for your persistence um, and I'm sure we've, no. all, we've all suffered ghastly internet connections in the last six seven months. Oh. Can I you know, my apologies no, 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 being on the phone. No, I, I keep on my screen right now, throughout the whole of this, I've had your internet connection is unstable, been flashing up, which has been... Uh, yeah. Cool. Can you... I mean, it's, it's a very distinctive style and it's, it's really arresting. I love it. And, but can you tell us a bit about how you decided on this particular style for the illustrations was it all your idea did you have discussions with Rebecca and Lisa how did you decide on giving the book this look um I guess it's difficult really to to explain because I think it has come from a style I kind of in the way I draw women normally um I think Rebecca and Lisa were so great that they kind of just let me have free reign with it um and I just kind of like researched the each different philosopher and then went from there trying to kind of capture what they looked like I guess across the board I think what was like such a great part of this project was some of them didn't have any photographs um like you know ancient like some of the beginning like Lala didn't have any photographic evidence really so that was like super exciting to be able to kind of illustrate them for what felt like well, not the first time but it was um yeah it was an amazing Kind of opportunity but yeah I don't know it's just it kind of came that's how I would have drawn them really but I'm glad that everyone seems to like it absolutely and it, it did you have a, a fa I mean again a rather invidious question but did you have a favorite uh, woman philosopher to illustrate was there somebody who oh. who's, who's, you know really grabbed <laughs> you and or not I, I don't know no I think lots of them um, I think it's such a diverse range of women to draw that that was super exciting. I feel like they all had their quirks and I could kind of try and get that across in, in each individual illustration, not just of the woman themselves, but the um, kind of the background. And then also with the cover, we kind of tried to kind of illustrate these ornate frames, but based upon maybe the time or the period that each philosopher was from. So that was kind of a nice part of it as well, to kind of like try and get that into a frame, but I think it worked really well. Um, I love doing all of them, like they all had their own different things I wanted to bring into the illustration. So yeah, it's difficult really to choose one. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. It's lovely to have you. Uh, Cheryl, Whiting, no, no Cheryl Whiting says, can you show us some of the illustrations? Anthony, maybe at the end, you know, when we, we're going to finish pretty promptly on time at about eight, you know, within a minute or so of that. May, uh, is it possible for you to share one or two of the illustrations? I don't know. But um, if not, um, you'll have to go online. You'll have to buy the book. <laughs> you'll have to buy the book. Um, I want to, I, I, we're not going to, be, I mean, it's lovely. There's so much interest. I'm sorry we can't get really to any more audience um, questions now. Um, I'm hoping that we can continue the conversation on social media in some ways. I'm hoping, of course, that next year we can meet in person and have these discussions yes. face to face. But, but I would like um, to, I, w I, I would like to raise um, a question with Rebecca and Lisa myself. 
Um, because one of the, the most, and you've touched on this yourselves this evening, because one of the most interesting things to me reading this book um, is that quite a few of these women philosophers were actually really quite famous in their own day and well respected and well read. And, you know, there were always women and plenty of men um, who engage seriously with their work. I mean, I'm thinking of somebody like Mary Astle, who in her, you know, barely known now, but really pretty well known and famous in her own day. And of course, Hypatia, who you've mentioned, was enormously famous. Young men came to study with her in Alexandria from all over the Greek world. She was known as the philosopher. She was immensely famous. And so it's not a case that all these women had to struggle away in obscurity in their lifetimes and yet and yet after their deaths so many of them not all of them but so many of them fell out of the canon if you like we just or never got accepted into the canon which is not read not discussed not engaged with very quickly after their deaths and i find this fascinating because it seems to me that there's clearly some kind of inst wider institutional or cultural problem going on here which is stopping women sort of getting accepted into general reading general university curricula um, and that goes and that's despite the fact that there have always been open-minded and intelligent men and women prepared to engage with their work and I was discussing this with my daughter who's 20 and studies theoretical physics and she said oh it's very similar in, in physics and she made the succinct point she said women have to be alive to fight their corner and when they die that there aren't people fighting for them I and mean, of course now there's you but you know in the past there haven't been people fighting for women particularly after their death and i just wondered what the two of you had to to say about that because I, I found that very striking uh, Rebecca, would you like to start? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think it has to do with the kinds of institutions that control the production and maintenance of knowledge, essentially. So a lot of these women were very famous, but many of them were doing their work outside of the normal academic institutions that sort of maintain this history of philosophy that we're told when we when we learn philosophy at university. Um, and so sometimes they're not considered sort of proper philosophers or they're only um, considered, you only read them if they engage with a male philosopher who was actually in an academic institution. And women and people of colour and other minorities have been barred from these institutions until the last hundred to eight, no, very, really not very um, distant past. And so I think now that's why we're starting to see this sort of um, reimagining of and re like we're relearning the history of philosophy only now because there are more women and more people of colour and more queer people in philosophy departments who are beginning to grapple with um, the people who've been sort of institutionally forgotten. So I think it's, it's a lot to do with, with the academy and the institution of philosophy. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I completely agree with what Rebecca said. And I do sometimes think it feels a little bit like the goalposts keep moving in terms of who gets to be counted. So I think mm. sometimes of the comments in terms of the book or when we do potentially kind of raise questions around other people's kind of histories of philosophy that they've written or the people they include in their canon, suddenly it's like, oh, well, it's only these things that really count as philosophy. And those tend to then just reinforce this idea that it's only a certain type of people that that qualify yeah. and I think that for example we often people say oh it's like logic and metaphysics and epistemology but then we have people like Camus who like most people consider to be a philosopher but he wrote mainly literature but then when you say Iris Murdoch then potentially um, she's not really considered part of the same category so I do think part of it comes back to this idea of man as like logical rational being yeah. Is then associated with the identity of a philosopher and I think we just need to make sure that we're really questioning why we have those assumptions. Yeah. Yes I, I, I think yeah I think that's so, that's right because I mean the philosophy it only, it only means love of wisdom you know so let, let's be inclusive here um, yeah I mean as you say as the, the, the you're saying that as the book says you know even Oluwole you know herself 
she was um, often critiqued by other black Nigerian male philosophers for not doing philosophy. Uh, so there are, um, you know, real sort of um, rigid mindsets, I think, which sometimes need to be questioned. But as I said, we've got these as well as the academy changing we've got these great podcast series we've mentioned a history of philosophy without any gaps there's also the philosophy bites podcast series so there are more platforms now which are giving more voice for to women and to other underrepresented groups it's not just women so just my final question um before signing up we, i sort of say farewell to everybody is what next so what next for women in philosophy what next for other underrepresented groups in philosophy what's the next step lisa do you want to start yeah i will i think really quickly just before i do um give a response to that question i think part of kind of for us the next steps is also around kind of celebrating this moment um just because coming to the end of the event i wanted to give a few thank yous if that's okay just okay. um based on what's happened so firstly just thank you obviously to angie for kind of hosting our event this evening and thank you to anthony um i also want to give a huge shout out to our team at Unbound. Um, we had an amazing team of women working on this project from Katie Guest who initially um, kind of believed in us to like take the book forward and then Deandra, Anna, Amy, uh, Georgia, we had some really great support. Clearly a huge thank you to our contributors who have made the book what it is, um, to Emmy, our incredible illustrator who brought it to life, everyone who supported the book. We crowdfunded the book in 28 days and we really thought it was going to take us hundreds of days if if at all so thank you and then obviously really importantly our friends and family and housemates and colleagues partners parents siblings everyone who literally heard us speaking about this book for hours and hours um and obviously a huge thank you from me to rebecca who has done so much work to make this happen so very quickly in terms of next steps <laughs> hopefully everyone buys the book <laughs> everyone changes <laughs> their mind about who counts as a philosopher um but i just hope these conversations continue um and that we have more people speaking up Thank you, Rebecca. Final word from you. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. Um, I also think it can't, so it can't only be about reading this book or reading one book by women in philosophy, in philosophy or adding some women um, to your syllabus. It has to be about supporting the people who are in or not able to access your institutional settings now. So if you've enjoyed The Philosopher Queens and you think it's a book that needs to be read, I advise you if you're at a university to go and look at your own department and see who you can support there. Go look at your reading lists and see what you can do and make sure that you're supporting your students um, who may not feel like they're at home in philosophy at all. Um, so it can't just be about reading more. It has to also be about acting more and making sure that you're supporting people as much as possible. Thank you so much. So, well, sadly, we've come to the end. Um, I've thank you so much all for joining us. I've found it all everybody's questions really stimulating. I'm so sorry we couldn't. I got in as many as possible. I'm so sorry we couldn't get all the questions in. Let's hope the conversation, as we've said, continues in in social media. I want to just close by inviting you all to thank um, our special guests, Anita, Emmy and Ellie, um, Anthony, of course, uh, for being our master of ceremonies, and of course, above all, for Rebecca and Lisa for their game-changing book. Here it is again, the book, which I urge you all to buy, to read, to incorporate into your own work and teaching. And now let us raise a glass, a, a glass to uh, all philosopher queens, past, present and to come. Thank you and stay safe. <laughs>